Good evening, everyone. It is a great pleasure that we welcome you to DLA Piper. We're delighted to have you here tonight. And uh, DLA Piper is a global law firm. We have lawyers across the globe focusing on venture capital and corporate venture. And we have the largest <laughs> venture capital and corporate venture practice in the world. Tonight, we have a data-rich seminar for you on the latest trends in research, development, and innovation <coughs> in the global technology economy. And we are excited to um, announce and introduce to you our two speakers for tonight. Um, they're world-renowned professors. The first is Dr. Martin Hennig. He has done research in over 13 countries in Asia, Europe, Israel, and in the United States. He's lectured and researched at Stanford, UC Berkeley, in Munich, Zurich, and he's authored books on the global, globalization of venture capital. And we have Dr. Max von, von Zedwitz. He's the managing director of GLORAD, which is a think tank and a research center for global R&D and innovation. And he creates insight into global innovation patterns and development tools for innovation and R&D managers to leverage local innovations for global impact. And we also have here two partners from our DLA office here in Palo Alto. We have Mark Radcliffe, the chair of the Corporate Venture Group, and we have Louis Lowe, the co-chair of the Emerging Growth and Venture Capital Group. Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you very much for that introduction. We, you know, Nicole and Jennifer were with us um, along with uh, uh, Max and Martin down in Monterey where the uh, Corporate Venture Capital Conference by GCBI was the largest in history with over 700 registrants of uh, 400 new uh, people attending. So I think the certainly the global cor the corporate venturing segment of the industry is expanding and as people know last year was a record year with over 70 billion dollars um, put to work in the uh, in the emerging growth economy. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have our co-sponsor, Gerald Brady, in the back from Silicon Valley Bank. And Silicon Valley Bank, as many of you know, is the leading bank serving entrepreneurs and investors. But I, what, you, what you're about to see tonight, as uh, Jennifer indicated, it is truly unique in the depth of the information that you're going to see. This, you know, uh, Louie and I have been to innumerable conferences on venture and corporate venture. We've never seen the depth and breadth uh, both from a timeline and from a geographic perspective you'll see tonight. So I think you're very fortunate and you're going to be even more fortunate because after this is over, we're going to have wine, one of my favorite winemakers, uh, Greg LaFollette from Akamista. I've been drinking his wine for 19 years. He's the, he is so renowned in the Pinot space that he actually taught Mouthfield at the University of Burgundy. So the French were learning from the Americans. Anyway, so without further ado, I'm going to turn over our speaker. Video available afterwards. Pardon what? The video available. Oh, the video will be available afterwards on our on our site. So there, the slides are not going to be available, but they will be available um, through the video. So, thank you very much. Okay. Mark. All right. Um, I hope this microphone works. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. <laughs> I don't have to shout, which is uh, really helpful. Just uh, last week, I wasn't able to speak at all. I had laryngitis. Uh, which if, uh, if it has ever afflicted you, literally you just open your mouth and absolutely nothing is coming out. <laughs> You're mute. Um, so I'm in a fortunate uh, situation. I can talk again. That's you know, like a little child making small steps. Uh, so Martin and I are going to be talking to you tonight about uh, global innovation, global venture capital, global R&D. Um, I'm taking the global R&D, corporate R&D uh, point first. Uh, and Martin will talk more about venture capital um, and the great data that he has about it. Martin and I share at least one more thing, uh, which is we're both from Switzerland. <laughs> which means it's extremely important to start on time. Yes. <laughs> um, all I have to confess, genetically, I'm not from Switzerland whatsoever. You know, I'm more from Eastern Europe and Central Europe, so genetically, at least, uh, uh, it hasn't worked for me so well. Uh, but at least, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll do the effort, uh, we'll start on time. So, um, as you ha perhaps have been able to see already from this slide, um, 
not only do I have uh, GORAD as my main affiliation, I'm also at the University of Kaunas, or uh, to pronounce it properly, Kaunas, uh, which is uh, the second largest uh, city in Lithuania. And you would wonder, what the heck does this guy do in Lithuania? <coughs> By the way, so does my wife. You know, she has the same question, what the heck does this guy do in Lithuania? Uh, and luckily we have at least uh, one professor from Lithuania right here, and there may be other Lithuanians in here as well. Just make yourselves known. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a great place to study Eastern Europe, and you wouldn't believe what's going on in the Baltics, and you wouldn't believe what's going on in Eastern Europe. Please travel there at some point. Uh, there's a re revolution happening. Uh, not unlike what's happened here, perhaps in Silicon Valley 30, 40 years ago, there's something happening here as well. Um, I also have a number of uh, locations with Florat in Shanghai, uh, in Switzerland, in Sao Paulo, uh, here at San Jose State, and Arias uh, and uh, Tejo. Are you from San Jose State University where we are hosted as well? So thank you very much again for those two uh, professors who are uh, so kind to work with us here in Silicon Valley on global R and D and global entrepreneurship. Um, Silicon Valley is a is a unique place. I don't really need to tell you that, right? I mean, you, you're here for the same reason that I'm here, which is uh, what the heck is going on in Silicon Valley? There's something. This is something exciting about this. Um, and uh, this, this is also a reason why many corporates are coming here. Uh, they too <coughs> are coming to Silicon Valley. And the big question that we would like to, uh, or I'm, I would like to ask ourselves is, in the context of Silicon Valley, um, what's global about Silicon Valley? What's global about Silicon Valley innovation? Um, because uh, let's face it, uh, for most of us, uh, we come to Silicon Valley because of the innovation that's happening here. There's nothing necessarily global about it. But there is something global about it, and I will show you what is global about Silicon Valley innovation. Um, I think it's fair enough to uh, first, uh, as an academic, I have to do this, uh, to define the term. So let's define the term uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, is this Silicon Valley? This is Silicon Valley for many people who have never been here. They look at this and say, oh, Silicon Valley, you look happy at Apple, Google, you know, San Francisco, skyscrapers, this must be this must be a center of skyscrapers and office parks and all of that stuff. Uh, who knows where this really is? There's at least one person here who should know, because I talked to her earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is, uh, it's in Chile, Santiago de Chile. This is not Silicon Valley. <laughs> This is not Silicon Valley, this is Santiago de Chile. I know this is perhaps uh, how we would like Silicon Valley to look like at some point, or this is the kind of the image that we'd like to have visitors who come here to, you know, to remember Silicon Valley as center of high tech. Uh, but actually Silicon Valley looks more like this. <laughs> Flat, green, lots of trees, um, very pastoral, rural. But this is where the, the magic happens, after all. Uh, so something is going on here that is uh, a little bit different um, and, and many other places, including <coughs> Santiago, including Chile, uh, including Lithuania, uh, China, Switzerland for that matter, have been trying to replicate what's going on in Silicon Valley, coming here, studying it, uh, turning it upside down, analyzing it uh, from front to end, from end to front, um, and trying to replicate this in some way. And I've, I've done a little collection of those attempts. Um, these are all of the various places that actually call themselves after Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley imitators. There is a Silicon Alley in New York City. I'm sure you're familiar with that. There's a Silicon Wadi in Israel. There are different Silicons out there. And obviously they have been inspired by the Silicon here. And then there are also Silicon Valleys that are perhaps a little bit more closely curated to what's actually going on here, but are not really calling themselves Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley lookalikes, uh, the, uh, the, uh, for instance, the Electronic City in Bangalore, Route 128, Research Triangle Park. I know these are not perfect copies, these are not perfect emulators, we're doing something different. And I think this is important to take away for everybody, especially for those who come here, that uh, if you want to come here and replicate something, please replicate at least the right things. <laughs> uh, don't look for best practices, because they are not necessarily the best wherever you take them. Please do not replicate the real estate prices. Do not replicate the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> some, some, you know, some countries are actually much better at that. Replicate what really matters to you. <clears throat> so this is Silicon Valley, the lore of the concept really, and this is uh, why many corporates are coming here as well. 
kind of placing uh, your offices here. RID is one of them, and this is what I would like to look at. Um, I've looked at these RID centers of foreign companies in the area, in the Bay Area, not just the Silicon Valley, per se. Um, and this is what I have found. I'm, I'm running a, a relatively large database of more than 10,000 RID centers worldwide, 500 companies and 10,000 RID centers. And this is the snapshot of the Silicon Valley Bay Area. Uh, some 300 RID centers from all over the world, including the United States. Um, <coughs> And what you do see is that many of them are actually here in the South Bay, San Jose, Santa Clara area, and others are elsewhere. Just because they, uh, just because the bubbles are bigger, hmm? the numbers are bigger, doesn't mean that's perhaps necessarily a more impactful contribution uh, to innovation. Some of those uh, individual points. Uh, <coughs> this may be a, this is an individual R&D center. It may be at uh, 2,000 people, and another dot in this map may be just 20 people, 30 people. But the size, the size of these dots uh, is kind of standardized to size of the RD center. But it gives you, an, it gives, it does give you an idea of uh, the locations. It does give you an idea of uh, the attractiveness of Silicon Valley, not just as a uh, um, as a place to start up companies, but also as a place to start up R and D centers. And this is an important connection to make because many global companies come to Silicon Valley. Uh, not necessarily because of the, the technology that's here or because of, uh, especially in the case of foreign companies, of uh, a, an access gate to a market that perhaps is here as well, but really because it's relatively easy to start up and, and engage in the startup game. Um, and I, I will elaborate on this a little bit more uh, in, a, in a, just a few minutes. Not too many minutes because Martin also uh, needs some time. And uh, I'm Swiss again, so I'm trying to stop exactly at 25 minutes. Uh, in the context of the United States, um, Silicon Valley is perhaps not that unique. Uh, there are other areas, other states, other regions, other uh, cities, which are also very attractive uh, as hosts for uh, global R&D. Um, and these are, again, a, it's a bubble chart of the locations of R&D centers just in the United States. Not even looking at Canada or Mexico, Canada will be a, our northerly neighbor in that sense, uh, not too far away. Um, but as, as you can see here, Silicon Valley may be still one of the larger bubbles, but it's no longer necessarily the only bubble. Um, and I do not mean this in the negative sense of a bubble. No, it's not a hype bubble. Uh, it's a very strong bubble. Uh, we have the Northeast, the Tri-State area, we have Massachusetts, uh, we have obviously the, the, the automotive centers uh, around Detroit, uh, we have quite a bit of R&D also in Texas, Florida, uh, in the uh, Southwest, North Carolina. Um, R&D in the United States is surprisingly nicely distributed, which is a good thing. Um, if we look at R&D in other places, it's far more centralized in just a few cities, quite literally, uh, which then stand out. Uh, you will perhaps know that Shanghai is the city with the most foreign R&D centers in the world. Uh, this is not because Shanghai is, per se, the best place to do R&D in the world. It's, in many ways, the only place to do R&D in China. Okay. If you want to be in China, yes, you go to Shanghai or perhaps Beijing. Yes, please, you have a question. So the quality and the, the kind of research that happens varies tremendously uh, across that geography and across the world. And it does, so, yes. Would you comment on that? I will, I will. So this is not all research, uh, it's R&D. Um, and a lot of the R&D is a small R and a big D. Um, some of the R&D is uh, basic research, but many corporates especially are pulling away from the fundamental technology development and are focusing more and more on applied R&D on, on product development, platform development, perhaps, uh, rather than basic research, except uh, pharmaceuticals and healthcare companies, for instance, or some industries in which we really fundamental physics <coughs> are actually done. Um, depending on uh, what kind of R&D you're going to do, um, you will seek different locations. Um, you will more likely engage in basic research uh, in Research Triangle Park. You will not necessarily do fundamental R&D uh, in, I don't know, in Kansas or uh, in, in, in Southern California, per se. It really depends a bit on, on the industry. It's difficult to make a generalization here because every industry is different. Uh, and even within industries, companies act quite differently as well. Um, 
but if you do want to do research in the United States, uh, you do want to be close to certain top universities and other top places. Mm -hmm. uh, you only need to have one or two locations really to have access to the market. And the United States is not as uh, rigid with respect to access to the mm -hmm. market as many other countries are. China, for that matter. Um, and I'll speak about uh, China in this context uh, in just a little while. So uh, maybe another point to take away, actually almost a quarter of all R&D locations in the world, R&D centers in the world, are located in the United States. Right? Almost one quarter, 24% out of that database at least uh, of 500 uh, <coughs> companies. Um, and this is to uh, this question, in a way, is a good segue to what you just asked. Um, research or development, uh, is it technology, is it uh, very often market? What actually drives these companies to locate R&D in certain places, uh, in places like Silicon Valley, in places like North Carolina, or in Shanghai? And I've, uh, I've collected that for you. Uh, this is no, this is no uh, fundamental research. This is no, this is no Nobel Prize winning results here. But typically, it's uh, access to local technology. This is one of the main drivers uh, for many companies, especially in mature industries. No longer is it possible to do everything yourself. You reach out to other companies, to other uh, uh, technology inventors. Um, this is one of the first ways to do this. IBM set up of its research lab in Switzerland, in fact, was. Uh, reaching out for technology access in, in Europe. Uh, and Zurich has one of the best universities, the best technology universities in Europe. So that was a, almost a, uh, uh, you know, a no-brainer uh, to set it up close to it. Access to local markets is one of the other uh, important reasons. And those two reasons are probably accounting for some 80 to 90% of all rational location making. Um, access to uh, Shanghai as a market. Uh, for instance, for Medtronic, a medical devices uh, maker. They're, China is a huge market, 1.3 billion people, which means uh, 1.3 billion people who uh, throw themselves in front of cars, potentially, and need reconstructive surgery, need all sorts of access to medical support and devices. And it's a lot more traffic and a lot more crazy people who have absolutely no regard for a person's safety in China at least my personal perception. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've lived in China for 12 years, so <laughs> probably more than most of you. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a crazy country in many ways. So. But this is one of the reasons, and many foreign companies go to China in order to have access uh, to China with R&D, because R&D is in many ways the entry ticket for them to actually do business in China. Um, following customers may be another reason, um, especially if you're a supplier, for instance, uh, a supplier to a GM, a supplier to Volkswagen, they may very, very easily say, if you want to continue to be our global supplier, you need to be present in in, in, in Shanghai, in Beijing, uh, in Changchun, uh, with a technical service center where you support our product development there. You may have no choice. You will have to set up a, a product development center there. Tax incentives uh, are not a very strong reason, um, not just gaining a few percentage points off, but really uh, looking at the idea that R&D is mostly an expense, right? Um, which you could write off uh, where you have profits, but where do you have profits? Mostly in places where you sell a lot of products. Huh? Where, where do you sell products a lot? For instance, in China. So this is one other reason why we have seen a lot of R&D move into China. We can write off R&D expenses. So suddenly something that will cost $50 million in the United States would only cost you 10 or $15 million in China because you've been able to write off most of these costs. And it's a, again, almost a no-brainer. It's almost, almost the Chinese paying for our R&D in China. Um, sometimes responding to strategic pressure, you will notice I have no longer named any companies here because they don't necessarily want to be singled out. Um, <laughs> But the local content clauses are especially uh, important in this context. Uh, uh, governments will say, uh, China's not the only one, uh, will say, uh, if, you, uh, if you want to be able to sell your products in our country, you will have to set up R&D. You will have to deliver at least 50% of your value add in R&D in our uh, home country, and maybe 70% of, of the supply chain will have to be done here. And this is a very strong motivator to set up R&D centers in many, many countries that otherwise would not be necessarily attractive to do R&D. Now, luckily, this is not the case for Silicon Valley. Um, 
Silicon Valley has no such local content clause. So there's nothing in explicit terms. Uh, but if you do look at it from a global point of view, and these are some of the data uh, that uh, Mark and Louis were mentioning before, we have lots of this data. This is a global map of all the R&D <coughs> centers um, of US origin. Hence, the United States is actually blank. <coughs> these are all the global R&D centers of, the, of US uh, headquartered companies and where they're located. Many of them in Europe, so this is a strong technology drive. Um, many of them have market access reasons as well, but most of the market access reasons are in China or in India. India also has a cost advantage, especially in software development. Uh, you see a lot of them in Japan, um, some of historic reasons as well. Singapore here, um, and also starting in South America, still relatively little in Africa, uh, and surprisingly little perhaps also in Russia. Um, for those of you who are still familiar with the term BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, really when it comes to global R&D, it's the exact opposite. Huh? Mm -hmm. It's China first, and then India, and then Brazil and Russia. And between Brazil and Russia, Brazil wins more on the market side, and Russia wins more on the research <coughs> side. Um, I've just for this presentation here, I've actually taken the subset of Silicon Valley-based companies only. So what would you expect to see? What would you expect to see? Similar, different. Similar, different. Huh? Uh, I didn't know myself until I actually looked <coughs> the map. And this is what we actually do see. These are the global R&D centers only of uh, Silicon Valley headquartered uh, companies. So Intel, or uh, uh, Google, or Apple, and companies like that who are literally based in, some even California. It's just Silicon Valley based. Um, and it's a, it's a similar picture. It's a similar picture, but something stands out. Uh, for instance, you do see that uh, uh, Shanghai is not quite as attractive as it should be, perhaps. It's Beijing. And Beijing tends to have more of an IT attraction. Um, there's a lot more IT going on in Beijing than in Shanghai. Uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, very attractive for a lot of our IT companies from Silicon Valley here. And I'm sure this is something that you see in, in the decisions of that corporate mm -hmm. venture capital, or venture capitals in general are making. And Tel Aviv is clearly, uh, sorry, Israel is clearly not a country that wows companies over because of its huge market, right? <laughs> it's a tiny little market, if anything, uh, and difficult to access market on top of that. But it has very strong technology and something else. They're very, very entrepreneurial. And I think this is something that uh, uh, Silicon Valley companies intuitively resonate extremely well. Um, by the way, Silicon Valley, if, you, if Silicon Valley were a country, Silicon Valley would be the fifth largest source of global R&D, ahead of France, ahead of Netherlands, uh, ahead of China and other countries. Just Silicon Valley. So sometimes you see these uh, comparisons. California, if California were a separate country, uh, it will be something like the seventh largest economy in the world. In terms of uh, global R&D, it will be actually the fifth largest country. But that's only Silicon Valley, not even California. Because there's in Southern California, even they have some technology and some good companies. I know. <laughs> I know we like to see this mostly in Silicon Valley, but even they have some. Yes, please. Yeah, I have a question about um, your definition of R&D. Good question. Because yeah. uh, um, <coughs> software is a big part of development of for any product, whether it's chemical, hardware, cars, or sports, and computer, etc. And software can be developed remotely. There are more and more people who work remotely. Right. So I'm a bit surprised to see, still see your earlier slide kind of big concentration in some geographical areas. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you explain this? And have you taken that into account? So the question is about, for instance, software R&D, uh, which is a different type of R&D from many other industries. And they tend to be very uh, distributed, typically, because you can do this remotely very easily. Uh, we have looked at quite a bit of software companies here as well. And you're absolutely right. They tend to be far more decentralized and more distributed in their R&D setup than, uh, for instance, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, uh, the question could also be asked in terms of software, is that even R&D? <laughs> software development, is this even R&D? Because uh, it's not even very often even protected under patent law, it's a, it's a design, it's a copyright. Um, 
why would you know if, if you are in pharmaceutical RD, for instance, for you, software RD is uh, it's not RD. It's not really research. It's not really development. Even if they're writing code, they're, they're writing stuff. They already know what they're going to do. It's more like engineering. Um, what we've done here is we have actually used the company specific definitions of R&D. They think it's R&D, we think it's R&D because we don't want to come in and second guess these experts in their own fields about what is R&D. For them, this is R&D. And that's, this includes research, includes product development. Uh, we, we do draw the line when it comes to technical service and quality control. This is no longer really part of R&D, uh, but it's very often no longer part of R&D for these companies either unless uh, they, they, they um, sort of put this under the umbrella of an R&D center for political or tax reasons. Many people are calling now more sort of Silicon Valley than the software valley. The software valley, yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, uh, there is, there's quite a bit of biotech in Silicon Valley as well, so I wouldn't um, want to forget about uh, the, the biotech, the pharmaceutical, the healthcare industry in the valley as well. And there's increasingly more going on in automotive R&D as well. I mean, Tesla is just one example. Uh, but uh, we've been able to observe how foreign companies are moving into the valley with uh, R&D in automotive R&D for at least 20 years. So this is not something completely new. But Daimler, Daimler uh, Benz, for instance, Mercedes, they've set up a research <coughs> center here in Palo Alto in 1997. Right? So they've had the foresight that something was going on here that was going to be important and relevant for them uh, sooner or later. All right, um, a couple of examples now of these uh, uh, drivers uh, beyond market, beyond technology, beyond taxes, and so on. There's access to entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial talent, which is really something reasonably new. Uh, this is not something that we see a lot of uh, in, in academic literature yet. Uh, but ac access to the entrepreneurial ecosystem becomes much more important for global companies because um, uh, they realize that when they when they fail and they need to fail for innovation, right? Uh, there's no such thing as innovation without failure. Uh, if they do this as part of their global corporate setup, it is so expensive. It's so expensive to fail as a corporate. And some companies that have failed at the corporate level have literally gone belly up and gone under. We, uh, we, you know, these are the endurance of this work. These are other companies that have tried something innovative and have failed. So uh, if you are smart in a corporate, you know, packages into smaller startups, maybe with spin-offs, engage venture capital, hmm? uh, corporate venture capital, and do this at the small local level. It is cheaper, and I know you would say it's not expensive enough, yes. Uh, and it's a lot faster because you don't have to fight through the bureaucracy of a large 200,000 headcount kind of company. <coughs> and that is very attractive uh, for these global corporates. They just have a hard time of actually figuring out how to do this well. Um, and we have a few examples uh, um, of how they've done that. Uh, this hires actually one example which is happening right here. Hires a Chinese company. They make uh, uh, white goods. Wash, uh, dishwashers, laundry machines, and stuff like that. Uh, in addition to the R&D center that they already have here in the Valley, they set up an innovation center as, as part of one of the, uh, uh, so the local incubators, if you like, or accelerators, deliberately <coughs> apart from uh, where they already have R&D to keep flexibility and freedom and, and leeway to operate what they need to do. This is a very important step for them. Uh, Intel, a Silicon Valley based uh, headquarter uh, company in China, they have <coughs> R&D there. They have actually several R&D teams on the ground. They have a huge R&D center there. So deliberately they have uh, moved out some of their most uh, successful ideas into local Chinese run accelerators and trying to uh, bring them to what they call an internal IPO. And they have been able to accelerate the process by literally a magnitude not keeping it inside the, uh, the regular R&D product development process, but really accelerate this by spinning this <coughs> sort of out into this accelerator, keep them obviously an eye on what's happening, coaching them uh, with professional uh, acceleration advice, and eventually bringing them back in. So this is another way how large corporates can actually, uh, not necessarily by completely spinning off, but, but really by sort of uh, <coughs> starting up 
these ideas, uh, these engineers not necessarily want to become entrepreneurs and they're all right, but they would like to experiment whether this works for them at all. So that's, uh, uh, or, or maybe uh, uh, there was this white gap in Africa, um, something that uh, in terms of entrepreneurship is something to look out for. Africa's not a country uh, for great breakthrough technology, and it's a very difficult country as a market, but in order to tap into entrepreneurial talent, there's a lot of it in Africa. And some companies are now deliberately setting up R&D facilities as gates to the African entrepreneurial ecosystems. One, one example, Nokia in Nairobi. They have an R&D center, they're mostly going after the, the, the new ways of uh, how African entrepreneurs, how African consumers use cell phones, use uh, networks, use access to various services that they have online in different in ways that we are not even used to. So in order to, uh, to sum up, um, just a few things that I hope that you will remember other than the fact that Martin and I are both from Switzerland, I think we made that point, <laughs> is uh, there's actually quite a bit of uh, global R&D uh, in Silicon Valley, but actually uh, it's not really dominant. There's a lot of more R&D in other parts of the United States as well. And that's, I guess, is a good thing. You don't necessarily want to draw too much attention. But something which is perhaps more surprising is that Silicon Valley headquarters are already going global. It's far more than we would have expected. Um, and that's, that's a good thing. You know, there's a sort of a, uh, um, a view that Silicon Valley develops a not invented here syndrome for itself, that they you know, sit in this brew and kind of grow in it and only look at what's happening inside the valley. Luckily, given this data, this does not seem to be the case. Uh, Silicon Valley-based companies do go global. They reach out, they look at the into <coughs> technology and market uh, pockets elsewhere in the world, and they go after entrepreneurs outside their own entrepreneurial ecosystem. That's a great thing. Um, and that's sort of the third point here. Uh, I think Silicon Valley may actually be a pace setter for that as well. Rather than having foreigners coming to, uh, to a Silicon Valley and trying to replicate us, it looks as if Silicon Valley entrepreneurs themselves and innovators themselves are going global, carrying the virus of entrepreneurship into other places of this world. And that's very much a, a story of startups and a story of venturing and a story of venture capital. And this is how I hand over to Martin who's going to uh, take through through the world of global venture capital. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Max. Before we do that, I want to warm you all up a little bit. Thanks so much for coming. Hold on. You're going to have some more data-rich uh, information about investment from Martin. But um, one of the reasons we do these events is for you all to get to know each other and to get to know us. And so um, I was previously introduced. I'm Louis Lowe, and I, I am the co-chair of our emerging company and venture group. And I'm so proud to see so many of my good friends here in the audience. And what I thought would be fun to help set the stage here is if you could all help me out with a little exercise. Um, it would be great if everyone who is a corporate venture capitalist could please stand up. I see a lot of you. Corporate venture capitalists, OK. Um, I think that is 25% of this room, OK? Um, please sit down. Um, how about institutional venture, not corporate? Ting, ting, I see you over there. Um, okay. Uh, there were many, many of you on the list, but I think uh, fighting traffic coming down the, uh, the University Avenue didn't work. Um, entrepreneurs in the audience, founders, stand up, please. Okay. Um, lots of good information for you all tonight about where the money is coming from. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, um, Martin uh, very shortly. Um, you know, you, you said a couple of things, Max, which uh, I'm going to, uh, a couple of comments. There, there is no one size fits all. There is no best practice. Don't repeat what happens in Silicon Valley everywhere else. Um, I have to go report to our leadership group tomorrow about the markets uh, as we see it from inside the law firm. And one of the stats that I want to tell you about is that we're seeing 2x the dollars uh, from Silicon Valley going into San Francisco. San Francisco has become a market twice as large as Silicon Valley. When are the corporates going to catch up? 
that's a question I have. Um, another one is New York has surpassed Silicon Valley, uh, according to the latest study in terms of investment uh, funded. So I'm going to pass it over to my friend Martin uh, to tell us where is the money getting spent, what sectors, what stages, what are the valuations, what does it all mean, and then after that we have some Pino. Thanks a lot. Working? Yeah. So I only do half of these things because I was adding another half. I have to go. So uh, setting the stage, like Max did, I need to set the stage a little bit of getting clear on some definitions, startups, and their needs. I'm doing this more and more. I think this is a massive issue going global. Corporate, corporate VC programs, investments. Global investment flow, that's something I think I'm pretty much the only one doing for the last 15, 18 years. Corporate VC and exits, it's something I'm going to show for the first time, a few things here, you'll be stuff, and then performance considerations. So some of the stuff I have just recently shown, it's all very latest, up to last night, 4 a.m. this morning. <laughs> no, no joke, no joke. So, just on a definition. If you do global research or comparisons on looking at startups investing around the world, you cannot go by the typical US Series A, Series B, or C, or whatever, Series D, etc. The definition of the parts of the world is significantly different. And so if I do, and I've done massive large scale research around the world, up to 380,000 startups for the World Economic Forum at Stanford and 25 other universities, I look at pre-revenue companies as plain startup to get funded, product service development, oops, that's the wrong side, as pre-revenue companies, and then pre-profit, revenue pre-profit, and then profitable companies. That's the only way you can compare apples with apples on the same companies around the world. Everything else will not work, I guarantee you. So I scrap every research that I see, oh, a database from here, another database from here, another one. They're all different methodologies and definitions. That's just very important for you to understand. Another quick thing, what, and the pieces all know, the corporate pieces have we've been around here for all these years. What used to be a Series A up to 2005, and then looking at 2015 now, I've just had meetings this morning, we're talking about pre-seed, seed, post, or, or, or uh, second seed, Series A, and, and that's really what has changed as well. Mm. That is why I'm saying you compare old data from five or ten years ago, uh, you cannot get this. No comparison possible. So, understanding startup and then it's very quick. This has been based on the genome, startup genome project, and which came out this year. I was involved on a sideline with it, so I have actually I could just go the whole day on, evening on this. But what is it that the startup entrepreneurs are looking for? And number one, and the biggest worry still, and always is a problem we've made for a long time, is that funding on the one hand, market access, and then you have technical expertise, a lot less around facilities and, and other things. So this is, if you're a corporate VC or a VC, you're pretty much aware of, but that is from the entrepreneur side. The same six elements we just looked at, which are the needs. The question to me is, where are the corporates? In it? <coughs> and that's this yellow portion of it. So number one is market access. This is what, from a point of view of entrepreneurs. So it's market access. Number two, it's technical knowledge and expertise. Along with it, often also with sometimes testing at scale, which they cannot do in their own lab. Number three is a business knowledge expertise, and then the rest, funding number four. And you know what? That stuns me always, every single time. I teach a lot. In, I spent four months a year in China for the last 15 years, and in India for 14 years. And a few weeks out here in the valley, still in the valley here, I need to come here to, to keep my energy up. Um, when I speak to entrepreneurs around the world, when I say that, uh, funding. Oh, uh, I need to go to a corporate for funding. And it's really stunning when I look, and you really look at what they want. In the end, at the very end, that's what entrepreneurs tell me. And, and in reality, it's different. I'm going to the corporate to get the funding. 
that I say, run. Go to the corporate. If you don't know the CEO or the CTO, you go to the corporate venture group and figure out if they can bring you to the business line. And if you figure out the deal with you, they want to invest in you. Never ask for money, ask for a business line deal. And I guarantee you, my own startups and all these guys, that's the way we approach it, and done, done. So, just that's important to understand that funding, technically, most <coughs> people, and that you really have to think it through and line it up, is the market access. So, I do have, um, Slides and I had to reduce these to one, and um, because we're in the valley and just looking at U.S. and the valley, I had U.S. startups <coughs> all over the world. What percentage of all U.S. startups? About seven percent actually have an international presence in not in terms of internet sales. There's a physical office on ground. That's the way we count it, and then the way we do it is it doesn't matter if it's for R&D, it's for sales, marketing, support service. Doesn't matter as long as they have a physical office on ground. So I'm starting off, who goes to the US, and more importantly, because we're in the valley, uh, how many of them who come from Europe to the US actually end up in the valley? So of the 707, the 8% of all startups of, in Europe <coughs> have a physical office somewhere else in the world. And the large bulk actually is in the US. So of the 700, only about a third is ending up in Silicon Valley. How about from Israel? If you look at 22% have an office overseas, um, and if you look at the 144, <coughs> about a third is in Silicon Valley. So everybody, because when I listen to terms of words, say, oh, we need to go to Silicon Valley. There's nothing wrong. Okay, I'm just trying to put this in the correct perspective, as Max mentioned, as, as you just mentioned, right? It's not only in the valley. And um, you look from India, same thing. Of the uh, about uh, uh, a good half goes to Silicon Valley eventually. And the same is less, but it's uh, kicking in actually most recently, is also uh, the Chinese, same thing, about a half of them go to Silicon Valley. The Japanese, interestingly, not many, but if they do, it's almost all of them ending up in the valley, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter. I just wanted to make sure that you understand it's not only corporates going global, I can, I can have two more slides, just an hour on this, from anywhere to anywhere, I just don't have the bandwidth to not. And so I picked the, my slide from Silicon Valley, and this takes me like a day and a half to do one slide, just this is all manual, encrypted stuff, so I don't want to go. So, corporate VC programs. So, when we talk about corporate venture capital, and I'm look at, and for me, a forward looking potential scale and activity is always new corporate venture programs that come year after year after year. If it increases, guarantee you they will deploy more. So it's a good indicator for me always to look at new uh, corporate venture programs or new corporate venture teams uh, 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 coming up. And as you can see, um, uh, Russia is very low, uh, uh, Middle East, North Africa is very low, but uh, the U.S. It seems to be consistent in the last two, three years, uh, uh, sort of reaching a kind of a peak of 20, 20 new teams per, per year popping up. And these are real teams. Uh, there are other activities which they're doing, uh, made more kind of from a corporate business development. That's not included. These are real teams uh, which are labeled that way. Another one which is interesting, uh, when looking at the initiatives, where do corporates, and this is not only corporate venture capital now, where do corporates have uh, activities on VC funds in green, corporate VC units, accelerators, others, and incubators? And that's a, first of all, it, it has grown rapidly all over. And if you really look at corporate, this is the yellow portion, so the corporate VC uh, path uh, kind of uh, in increased along with others. That is not predominant when it comes to look at initiatives related to, 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 to innovation. That's what just I wanted to make sure you understand this. So oh, that means corporate venture capital is roughly uh, of all the activities uh, sort of like in the range of 20%. 
as part of all their innovation activities. Then we look at the share. I've been tracking this, and it depends a little bit on the database you pick. And uh, I've just done now uh, North America, Europe. It's not, it's very different in Asia. I'll give you a few numbers as a comparison, and you know, right? So we are reaching probably, I go back, now I even go a step back, which is not even here. And I researched the dot com rise and the dot com crash. Everybody said the corporates were large behind all this. And they were riding away for the tail end, and when the tail crashed, they crashed along with it. And uh, that was a, a massive hype. What is different? When I looked at to 2009, 10 onwards, suddenly, as it crashed, it was 16% at the peak of dot com. 16, and everybody said, that's way outrageous. Even me at the time, because historically it was two, two and a half times as much as ever before, two or three years earlier before. And then you start see kicking in 6, 9, 11, 13, 18% now, just in these two geographies. In Asia, it's depending on the country, um, I'm excluding <coughs> Japan now for the moment, it's 30 to 40%. And if I look at Japan, uh, I have the data, but I don't go into every slide here. It's, uh, they were included in almost 80% of the deals. That was stunning me, right? And there were only two, two other countries which had a similar ratio, and one of them actually being Thailand, which was out, way out of the blue. Um, but anyway, so what has interesting implication here, uh, as it came down from 16 down to 5, 6, 7 percent after the dot-com crash, started kicking in 2009. And that was the first time I looked back 25 years corporate venture investing, where for the first time it was against the industry cycle, the fi you know, the financial market crashed. A lot of stock market, a lot of things had a hard time, and for the first time, corporate started building up, and that was meaning to me a lot more strategic. Right? So that that's to me. That I really enjoyed when I saw that. Here's just some very latest stats that you see. Uh, an element that I have just come across, and I crunched a lot of numbers the last few nights. And I want to share one with you, which I'm sure I've done for the first time as a benchmark. If you see the dollar volume, uh, the, the number of deals going up to somewhere in the range of 2,300, if you look at uh, CB Insights data, I, I look at a lot of databases, they're within plus minus 5 to 10 percent. So it's pretty okay. Uh, CB Insights from a data point shares the precise volume of corporate venture capital. And what global corporate venturing does is looking at the total amount in those deals where the corporates are involved. So it includes the VC money and others' money. And the stunning number that I came across when I looked at all the global VC funding was if the total was in the range of 160 and 65 billion in venture capital uh, last year, that the corporates which had about an 18, 19, 20 percent coverage on the number of deals, they're up on 65 to 70 percent on the dollar volume deals included. Hold on, are you saying that the venture funded deals of those fundings, 65 to 70 percent is corporate money, not institutional no, venture? No, no, what I'm saying, no, no, I'm not saying this, uh, good question, maybe Very I was important. not precise. So what I wanted to say is, if I take all the deals and the total volume that goes into the deals, and I look at all venture deals with and without corporate venture capital. So if I take, including corporate venture capital, it was 160, about $5 billion around the world. <coughs> then at least one corporate was involved, the total volume was 110 billion, which was almost 70 percent of it. So that's what I'm trying to say. And if I think I may have a few slides here, also showing that the corporates. So the key to a successful venture funding now is to have a corporate in the syndicate. Is that Actually, a takeaway? It's dramatically increased. Yes, dramatically increased. But I think the biggest shift in the last two three years that you will see is that. Many of them are shifting a lot more earlier stage. And what stunned me is, I'm not sure I have the slide here, but it's all up here. It's 
seat funding, which was barely done five, six, seven, eight years ago by any of the corporates, you can count them on one hand, is kicking in all over. Good or bad news? Look it up. They all need, and it's particularly some of these uh, corporates, can you get, yeah, some of the corporates which are in industrial industries who need to digitize their industry. And they're totally lost. I mean, many of them. Right? They hire these ch uh, chief digitization officers and so on. And they want to get a radar screen and understand it. There's a question coming. Yeah, so are you including capital that's going in as LP money from corporates into VC funds as well? No, this is strictly, yeah, OK. This is strictly money that goes into the deals. So there's a lot more money, <coughs> you're absolutely right, that, and that goes into VC funds, which enables the corporates to also get kind of a bit of a radar screen. This enables get skin in the game directly on a specific deal that they may have an interest, either for a licensing or an acquisition, whatever, later on. Or as a launch, you know, taking a start with a launch. Martin, I'm sure you don't have the slide for this, um, although I know you have a slide for everything in your mind. Um, what do you think the slide would look like for deals with more than one corporate in the syndicate? And that's a trend that I've been seeing, oh, yeah. is yeah. The, what I call the CBC party, yeah. where once there's one, there's two, sometimes three. Okay, so uh, it's interesting to break it, you see, you see all the slides coming up. Um, you break it down by geography, and my experience is, for doing this now for 15, 16, 17 years, is when the market is more mature where with VCs and corporates, there tends to be a lot more, even direct competitors in the same space investing along with their competitor in the same deal. Then you go to emerging markets, and I've just taken China and India, and I carved these ones out, it's all separate. It was very stunning. Up to about maybe, I think, two and a half years ago, three years ago, a Tencent and an Alibaba would not invest in the same deal. And what happened was it started kicking in. Uh, Tencent was a lot more, I call it, they had a different business model. So they did the old stages from Series A, along with VCs, while Alibaba would be later coming in much later. So I started seeing Tencent being in. And I do remember I was in, I trained uh, their teams, by the way, in China. I uh, did a lot of uh, corporate venture trainings. In, and I remember when we had discussions on this. And so Tencent went in to learn about certain sectors of technologies and business models. And then very cheap, I mean, quote, quote, cheap, uh, at, the, at the level that was here in Silicon Valley. And I'm talking here uh, overseas in the Valley. And then you see in a series B, or C, Alibaba coming in, like two and a three and a million dollar round, and they wanted to invite, and they had a discussion actually, it's very funny in my training program, a discussion, uh, how do we do this? Because they were not used to co-investing. And then uh, 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 the guy from, from Alibaba said, um, oh, uh, can we invite you guys to come in? And it was very funny when, when, when the Tencent guy said, oh, we're already in. In series A, very cheap. Well, you can learn about this company. So we have already learned the game. <laughs> okay, so we are sorry. You have to take the two hundred million on your own, and they did. That was. Anyway. Would you humor me for a moment, Martin? Um, I would love to ask the audience uh, of you that are corporate venture capitalists. Um, how many of you have invested in seed stage? What I'll call a less than one million dollar check stand up. <laughs> Okay, yeah, there's more, there's more. Um, I think there's a huge move to yes. investing in creating yes. stage, stage, in creating programs, yeah, which is uh, very interesting. Yep, I see this a lot. And again, it's particularly also in the area of digitization and in medtech. A lot more in medtech now, they've got a lot more. I have a question about the definition of corporate. It yep. seems to me that you're referring to are long established companies. They are maybe part of uh, Fortune 100, 100, 300. So, uh, but there are also many uh, new young companies yes. that have emerged very fast, uh, maybe that have only 1,000 employees, but they, they've been very successful in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years. Uh, or do they also uh, participate in this, uh, in this trend? 
or not, or, or if you're not uh, included, then... Okay, so, so there are two parts. Absolutely correct. What surprised me when I recently looked at data of still privately held venture back and corporate venture back startups investing in other startups. <coughs> and it makes a lot of sense if you think it through because you're talking a complete value chain or delivery chain and they're, they're doing parts of it. But in order to have the breakthrough against some big boys, they rather team up sometimes with another small boy and then they control the entire value chain and they can go after the big ones. So when it comes, so if it's just a one-time investment they're doing, so there are two parts of corporate investments. One is uh, the ones that have a dedicated fund to corporate venture capital, but uh, uh, I'm not sure this year, but until at least the last year, I know it from Intel Capital, they behave like if they have a separate fund, but the reality is it's all balance sheet. Even if they say we allocate 100 million to India or this or that, it's still a balance sheet money and not a fund. So the key is do they have a separate team dedicated to this? That is balance sheet, so that is what's counted. So if a startup happens to invest in another startup without having a full-fledged team, that's not counted in here, okay? Mark, can I ask yep. a question? Yeah. Yes, um, as a bit of a comparison. Wait, wait, wait a second, uh, it's coming, the microphone. Uh, thank you. Very useful. Um, as a bit of a comparison and analogy, right? I, um, I, you know, I got family offices, <coughs> my own client base, and I speak in accountants and some of that. And and these guys, on average, are worth about a couple hundred million dollars yes. each, right? So one pattern that I'm seeing is that more and more good and bad are doing more and more direct investments. Oh. So what you what you're saying is that the CVCs, the corporates, are doing more and more direct investments. The numbers you presented here. Yeah. Are they direct investments? Yep. Wow. Yep, that's direct investments. That's not that's not fund investment. One and by the way, by the way, it is correct. Uh, my experience my is this okay? Yeah. My experience with the family office is actually, in my view, having a family office from an entrepreneur's perspective, sometimes is a lot e easier than a totally institutionalized one. Simply especially if they come with odd solutions or odd markets. Because many, I'm looking at the European family office as an example, they have been as their own corporate company which they had already operating in all these countries. You don't need to take the worries away about doing business in China, India, Russia, and so on and so forth, because as a corporation, as a company, Original, where they may have been founders and now they have a family of, they're really familiar with this. So I think it's actually, I, I hand over a lot of my startups actually to family of, just for that reason alone. Yes, somebody okay. had a question. Um, one name that hasn't come up is Apple. Yeah. They <laughs> spend $10 billion a year on R&D. Yeah. And uh, neither Max nor you mentioned. Can you shed a little light on their philosophy how do they invest? One fact that I know, uh, recently they have gone all over the world mm -hmm. and opened R&D centers next to the key R&D centers of competitors are in those countries. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little more? Yeah, that? so it's, uh, yes. So maybe Max, if you want, then you can chip in. I'm looking at it from a corporate venture, <coughs> not from an innovation point of view, that's more Max doing this. So interestingly, when I also look at acquisition of startups, it, it, it's very stunning always to me. I saw a lot of acquisitions which I, I, I was not even aware of. I, they didn't make headlines, maybe because some of them were not that big that Apple did, they're not even making a big noise out of it unless somebody picks it up and it happens to come out in the press. While others, when they acquire, they sort of like proudly say we have acquired and they like to have that news out as an example. But uh, that was surprising me. Uh, they are still doing a lot more in-house and proprietary than probably most other ones. So all I can tell is, I barely ever, this is another good indicator. I'm spending around the world traveling 200, 240 days for the last 70 years on venture and corporate venture capital. I don't think I've barely ever seen <coughs> an Apple person on a panel. Have you? I have not. Right? That's another thing. If they do it, it's more secretly. While others start bragging about 
Right. I mean, that's just an, another indication from my end. I'm not sure if uh, Max, you have uh, something to add on R and D with Apple. Yes. So. Uh, Uh, I've noticed this as well. Uh, Apple was or is still a relatively secretive company. Uh, they've done that for many, many years. They've been relatively, you know, keeping the information closed. On the other hand, they have a history of bringing in outside innovations in. Right. So in some ways, they they have been an open innovation company for <coughs> a long, long, long time. Just it was mostly one-way street. Um, for the last few years, and I think you've mentioned that, the last few years they started to open up R&D centers elsewhere. Um, the first one, by the way, in Israel, again, to tap into the talent entrepreneurial pool there. Um, they have had a relatively small R&D budget until fairly recently as well. You mentioned maybe $10 billion. Now this is, uh, they, they're growing by leaps and bounds here as well. Um, but Apple is not a typical company. You know, Apple is this, uh, not atypical in American company as Huawei, for instance, is a Chinese company. These are unique companies. They can only exist because they are unique. Mm -hmm. uh, there would be, there's no space for a second Apple. There's no space for a second Huawei in China uh, either. So that they can afford to do things a little bit differently. And they get away with it. They get away with it with some of us perhaps would consider bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, by not being open, by not sharing, by not uh, by not being on panels in some uh, in some cases, <laughs> by by not relaying some of the practices that they do, and uh, they seem to be able to get away with it. But I think it might be changing for Apple. Ch Apple is increasingly in a uh, you know, they're losing. They no longer have the uncontested market share that they used to. They no longer have Steve Jobs. They're now becoming a little bit more normal in that way. As a result, I think also their global R&D and their global innovation approach has to become a little bit more normal and a little bit more, uh, let's, let's call it mature. Okay, I'm not sure if anybody from Apple is here, <laughs> because he mentioned, <laughs> if you don't, you know. Yes, please come and talk to us if you're from Apple. And then I can tell you one thing, somebody from Huawei is here. So when you have your, uh, when you have your drinks and, and networking afterwards, look out for a lady dressed in a kind of dark, with dark hair, of course, and glasses. <laughs> And you're already down to 3% of the population. <laughs> She's sitting in the front row, so that's our last story. <laughs> now, where, are all, where is all this corporate venture capital actually going to? And of the 2,320 deals, it's almost precisely 50% <coughs> is done in the United States. So, and the rest you can see in, by the size of the bubble, and then of course, I'm not going even into the sectors, but it, it's a good picture instead of just having bar graphs all the time, the size of the bubble indicates and uh, 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 how big it actually is. And in Europe, of course, because of the small nations, it's dispersed uh, literally all over. Um, when you look at the sectors where corporate VCs invest in the top three sectors, again, it's about 50% it's health, IT, and financial. That alone makes 50, uh, uh, practically 50% of uh, all the deals being done. Media, services, consumer, transport, industrial, energy, telecoms are the other ones. Yeah. Excuse now, me, Martin, yep. Martin, could you go back one slide? Yep. I don't know, I think this may be on your mental slide, not on this one, but it's, how many of those US deals or Silicon Valley deals? Uh, uh, okay, uh, 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 let me see. I may have a slide coming up on this. Yes. Uh, but you will be, you will actually uh, be surprised that when, when you really look at, and uh, I, I do have a separate slide on, on I think it's in May, maybe coming up, 2017, it's less than half even to entire California, which includes North in, in, in Valley and even Southern California. It's uh, around at the 40%. Uh, in total of that one. Uh, and then, uh, one thing, it's don't, don't think, look, don't look even at the numbers, I want to show you two things with this slide. And uh, the takeaway on that slide, even if you see the buildup of the last few years on about, since uh, 2012 to 17, 5,700 whatever deals, you're up 1,500 deals. I think the key is, and that's very consistent. That, that's a takeaway. It, uh, when I saw these numbers, and I'm tracking them for a long time, in mature markets, which I say US, Europe, 
the pattern is almost consistent year by year. It's IT, health, media, financial services. Now, when you expand from the US into the more emerging markets, which are all the big growth markets, China, India, the pattern is consumers consistently first over IT, services, and media. So that's a, if, 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 take this away, because when you go, if you think you can just copycat all over it, uh, be careful, the ecosystem may not be there. The talent may not be there if you go too early of what you're doing out here. Right. So that is the takeaway, irrespective of the number in, and the, the, you know, a sort of the, the rise in growth over the last few years in terms of number of deals. Now, that's an interesting slide, and I'll look back at up one slide. Oh, sure. Back up one slide. Um, I think what's phenomenally interesting in this slide is how quickly we've seen the rise in China, how quickly we've seen the rise in, in India. It's been relatively flat in the U.S., but where is the growth? Okay. This is where it is. I'm, I'm, yeah, and I'm coming also to an interesting split, something that I'm always looking at that very few people actually do. I think it's one of the next few slides. Oh, that's the wrong slide. Um, which is, it's not this one, it's another one coming up. The number of, by number of deals around the world, who are the 10 largest corporate players? Alphabet, SoftBank, IDG, Tencent, Intel. So in other words, Salesforce, Qualcomm. So you get seven of the 10 are US. That's in terms of number of deals. Now let's look at, in capital, deals invested in. It's SoftBank, Tencent, IDG, Alphabet, da da da. It's four out of them. So that means the big Asians, I have Fidelity, Chinese, Alibaba, Chinese, US, again, a DST, and financial. So we have six of the 10 only when it comes to deploying and being involved in the big deals on where corporates are involved. So Martin, the question, Suki, is Fidelity, are those investments from a venture fund, or are they their mutual funds, which are now investing in late stage ventures? Actually, in Fidelity is probably the one I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I think I know eight out of the 10, where the money comes from and what's used for. In Fidelity, I don't know. If my guess is a lot of that is mutual fund money, Maybe. that's going to the late stage, because you're seeing you know, a lot of the larger fund complexes investing in late stage ventures. And on top of it, if you look at in which sector the money goes, I think that's interesting. It's suddenly you see transport massively, which you barely, you see a little bit over here in terms of number of deals. But this is very capital intensive <coughs> stuff that the Chinese and the foreign guys are actually coming in with deep, deep pockets. That was not the case five, six years ago. I was almost making a joke when I saw 12, 13, the big rise that you mentioned before in China and in India. My joke was, this is where I started training corporate VCs in China, 240 at one in one batch. I'm not saying this is the result. It looks like transport, <laughs> which I guess is ride sharing, is the big uh, <laughs> recipient of that money in the last That's year. It. <coughs> so, if this is the slide I mentioned before, another picture of it's sort of a bit looking at mature markets, vis-a-vis -vis more emerging markets, from a corporate venture investment volume perspective, and how things evolve over time. Here's the US, don't care the absolute numbers, this is the percentages, blue means it's domestic only. There is no foreign, that means non, no European, Asian, whatever, investing in those deals. Green is a hybrid, which can have both, and then you have foreign only corporates, which is the yellow one at the bottom. So that's the picture of the US, relatively consistent. That's to me the mature market. Look at this. You look at Europe, which for a long time was not doing much in corporate venture, again, 2014, a big rise up there. And you can see that the foreigners, and this were predominantly, by the way, the US, okay, coming over to Europe. I'm guaranteeing you, as of looking uh, into next year, I mean this year and next year, same graph, you will see a lot more Asians going to Europe, and I'll show you why in a minute uh, on another slide. You look at China, for a long time, I've been there for uh, 14, 15 years, there was very little corporate venture. 
And it was almost exclusively foreign corporates investing in China until the Internet Boys came up in, in China. And what that means is you see, uh, you see the shift here. A lot of foreign guys, foreign guys, and once they started kicking in, and now I see suddenly, for the first time again, uh, I'm not saying a reverse, but it's sort of like getting there, and what, what is it? So these are now increasingly, again, hybrid guys. Uh, that means it's a Chinese and a, look at here for instance, very little hybrids. So now the Chinese also are okay having a foreign corporate co-investing along with another foreign corporate into their own Chinese deals. And then India, <coughs> India is uh, still to me five, six, seven years behind. I, I call it the, the corporate VC jet lag. When I look at China versus India, I did this on VC for all these years, and I'm doing now this on corporate VC, they're still five, six years behind. And so when I look at what does it look like? Mature markets relatively flat. Uh, in high growth markets that are reaching towards this, you see a domestic portion dramatically increasing. And then uh, India still flat because the domestic guys are not moving yet that fast, but I, I, I've just been in, 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 in some sessions, and, and in November in some sessions. I expect the next two, three years, India is sort of like coming towards this dream where you see a lot more domestic corporates uh, kicking in. Now, quick one on this. US-based corporates investing globally, and this is pure corporate venture capital, uh, it's uh, unfortunate somehow the, the colors are not coming out. Uh, but you can see uh, domestic and international into companies. So the way I did this, and I'm showing this in, in a second, US corporates did about a thousand deals in 2017 somewhere, of which 29% outside their home country. And that means of the 1,000 plus, 776 were domestic. What's interesting is, and that's where they went to, interestingly, another 630 were financed by foreign corporates coming to the United States. So I'm looking actually, I call it the balance, or the balance sheet. You know, how much is, are US corporates investing locally? How much are they investing internationally? But also how much comes in from foreign corporates into the nation? And I've done this on venture capital, I've done this on corporate venture capital. You look at Europe, same thing, it's very similar. 600, almost 600 local is a large, a lot larger portion going international, more than half. That means less domestically. And where does it go to? The large bulk of the 332, it's 250 actually coming to the United States. It's really going after technology, right? Or uh, uh, new technology, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and still uh, a lot smaller portion actually coming into, into Europe in itself. So I, I, I think I will add one more, the Israeli, it's a very simple play, I make this quick. Uh, there's, uh, for the first year, not even a domestic corporate invested outside. That was very first year. They always had two, three, four deals going somewhere. First time not. But you see five, uh, five domestic deals, you see 75 coming in from overseas by other corporates coming into Israel. Mainly, and that deliberately picked them out. US APAC, Chinese Asians are kicking into Israel. It's amazing. And then you see the rest uh, of this. APAC, another quick one, is eight, almost 800 deals, almost half going outside, and still not that much going into Asia Pacific from a corporate direct investment perspective. So, a very quick on this. I was looking at the largest top 10 in each geographic region. And uh, it's more the color. You don't need even to read it. Look at the colors. You have US, Europe, Israel, Canada, China, India. And who are the 10 largest players in each region? First of all, you can see in the US, it's almost predominantly only US corporates among the top 10, except you know the super jumbo, which is top 10. <laughs> in Europe, uh, you have predominantly uh, Europeans. In Israel, it's predominantly US and now Samsung and the, the Chinese. And I expect a lot more Asians going now top 10 in, in Israel. Canada, still a US play. Um, uh, China is a, a, a nice mixed balance now from all over, as they, and India. Now, what does that mean? I looked at 
who are the guys who are consistently in which markets? Very interesting. So Intel, Qualcomm, and SoftBank are the only ones in last year that had three, um, three in three geographies out of six. They were top ten. So looking at, in, uh, at Intel, it was U.S., Israel, and Canada. Looking at Qualcomm, it was Israel, it was uh, China, it was India, and then you look at the SoftBank, which was U.S., um, here, China, and India. It doesn't matter. I just wanted to share with you a sort of like, it's not everybody going, going to the same destination all the time. Right? Depends on the market there, the sector in, and the strategy they're deploying for. Okay, on exits. If we talk investment, okay, don't need to read this. It's a color play. Look at this. These are the top 10 corporate acquires in each geography. And when you look at in the US uh, 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 <coughs> the acquires, there's only SoftBank in the top 10, so it's a US play. In Canada, it's a US play plus a 10 cent. So it's very strong dominant. In Europe, it's almost exclusively, with the exception of Salesforce, it's Europeans. It's still, a, in, that, in that sense, a local play, which really stunned me. Uh, I was expecting uh, this last year a uh, 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 more shift. And then you have <coughs> Israel, it used to be almost exclusively US, and now you see the Asians, uh, again, kicking in for the for the uh, um, uh, acquisitions. China, yes, it's APAC, 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 uh, and the US, uh, very little from, from Europe. And India is a mixed basket, and again, it's, it's getting a lot more Asians now into India as well, after the US has been dominating for this in the previous years. So, I only wanted to share this as a colleague to understand acquisition, surprisingly, in the mature market, it's a very domestic play. In the emerging markets, everybody wants to uh, play in. Global corporate exits. Yep. On the last slide, yep. IDG is Chinese. Uh, IDG. Oh, that, that, OK, I, hold on, yeah. IDG, OK, we can debate on this whether IDG, so they have a corporate fund in China. And uh, originally, it's a definition also where is the original headquarters, right? The original headquarters is not in China as a, as a, a, as a corporate, right? Uh, it's East Coast, something. Awesome. You guys know probably this better than us. It started out in East Coast. That's it. It started in East Coast. I know this for sure. Well, it's just that their corporate venture activity, corporate venture capital activity, is much larger in China and, and in India than it is actually in the United States. <coughs> So don't confuse that, because I was doing the same thing initially when I looked at um, that I trained this team, so eventually I had clarity. Um, so again, you look at, of the 203 acquisitions <coughs> that happened of venture, corporate venture back companies that were acquired by their by corporates, I'm not saying exactly the same corporate where he was invested in, I'm bringing a slide on it. It's still over half uh, of these portfolios, actually, of all uh, these acquisitions, uh, their portfolios um, from the United States, right? Yes. Uh, I have a question from a startup perspective. Yep. One question. That's okay. Yeah. Um, let's say uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting acquire uh, investors in my Series A round or Series B round. Yeah. Uh, does having a corporate investor helps bring an institutional uh, along, or are these things happening completely independently according to you? Uh, okay, so your question is, if you have a corporate VC in, are you talking about an acquisition or yeah, another investment? Investment. Uh, investment, okay. So normally what happens is the VC in is before the corporates. But as you see now, a lot of large companies staying a lot longer prior, right? So. <coughs> I think that a lot of corporates are chipping in, and I call it the, 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 the mutual funds and other investors which are not corporates and not very institutional VC private equity firms are kicking in. Uh, the reality is, I can tell it from you, it depends on the geography. If you have a big corporate in as an Asian portfolio, that gives a lot of credibility to the, 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 the Asians who may be a lot more risk averse. Yes, it has a massive impact. I'm not sure per se in the United States nowadays, 
But in Asia, definitely for sure. Right? Um, here is something other interesting. We look at IQ and an MA. And my, my uh, question was, if I look at the last uh, five years, how long does it take a typical holding period when the first corporate VC investment goes in until the company exits? Is there a difference in US, in Europe, and in China particularly? And uh, how long is the holding period? <coughs> and what surprised me more recently, and I have an answer for this, um, it is the last year from 16 to 17 has dramatically, or significantly increased towards IPOs. And it also has significantly increased on M&A. And why is that? Now think it through. There's a reason. Is it because you're going into early stage deals? Okay, so two answers to this. The, the, the point is, there it's not correct yet, but it will happen very soon. It will actually go even more dramatically because the corporates have started investing that much earlier only recently. Martin, you've got to repeat. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, the question is, uh, her answer was, uh, because the corporate VCs go in earlier. The reality is, it is true they go in earlier now, but the effect is yet to be seen. It's coming out in the next year. That's why it will even go further up. A second piece has to do with the corporates who have invested gigantic money into these unicorns, and the unicorns are keeping longer private than they anticipated. <coughs> and that's one of the answers. You have another one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just be loud. Um, no, no, it's coming. So you're showing, you're showing that. But you're showing that M and A is actually taking longer than IPOs as far as holding period. How is that possible? Yes, because some of the companies cannot make it public, and they're trying to get public and cannot make it public. Especially watch, watch, watch the bloodshed of a lot of unicorns going to happen. And they will end up in parts and pieces, even potentially, that's my prediction, as acquisitions. Because they may not be able to do IPO. Yes? Mark, Mark, uh, it's kind of hard to see the uh, Y axis holding period numbers. Could you? Oh, okay. One year, two years, three years, four years, five years. So that's about five years to the next line up here. What about up there? It's, it's, it's all the same. It's all five years, five what? years, five years. So that puts it into perspective a little bit. Right? And so. I predict that going forward, it will, will even take longer because the, the corporate VCs go a lot earlier. I have another slide on here, but uh, it even from the founding, uh, from the first VC investment to an exit, but since we are talking corporate side, I just wanted to share this with you, that it's, come, it's going up. And uh, if more and more corporate VCs are also turning pure financial place, that's a very important thing. They may do investments. If it happens to be along the strategy with a corporate, it's OK. You have a question? Yeah. Do, you, do you consider, for example, a Sapphire ex VCT venture as a corporate VC or as a, as a, as a institution? The, can you repeat the question? Sapphire. Ah, Is Sapphire, Sapphire corporate or institutional? Uh, OK. So to us, it is uh, even you can take any of even independent, the ones that spin out, even as team, as long as they have a, a large, significant, or whatever, 50, 30, 50% portion of their parent company as an LP in, whether it's strategically linked or not, but it's still, they still, they still hand over when they come across the right deal, but it's not a mandate. You see, most corporates have a mandate to take care of what they're doing, and I see a lot more now spinning out for whatever strategic I don't want to even go into it. But as long as they have a dedicated team to it and spun out, even if they spun out, but if uh, 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 30 to 50 percent of the capital still comes from the parent company, in the database it's still considered to be, just to be precise. Good question. Yeah. Question here. So it's an area of potentially interesting conflict because you have the VCs who are financially. It's an area of potentially interesting conflict conflict in the future because you have VCs who are driven by financial return, yep. uh, ROI, oh, yeah. um, and uh, fund life, 
which the dirty little secret is funds go 17 years, yep. not 10. Yep. <laughs> but the other fact is that you have corporate VCs who have very different metrics. Yep. Um, and for them, very often, for some, it is not financial return. And so you start so getting some interesting. I have a great slide. I think I have it in here. I deliberately put <laughs> okay. that in because it's, it's a big challenge coming up. Let me see. Here is another. I like this one a lot because I had tons of debates for the last 10 years on this. A lot of entrepreneurs always tell, tell me, is it, oh, I don't want to have, go to this corporate because the Cisco's of the world are famous in the old days. The investment, we're going to acquire you. And some entrepreneurs just don't want that. And so they're deliberately not going. And so I, t I needed to start clean up a myth. How many of the corporates who have invested in a startup, and I'll give you the geography, it differs by geography, how many of them are actually acquiring the, that portfolio company where they have invested in? And if you look at on a global scale, it's somewhere it actually has come down from 20% even less, because a lot more corporates yeah. have come to the play not for acquisition, but for strategic, and I call it radar business. They're going to be in there to see how the markets and technologies and how all this stuff is moving. And it's not per se as in the old days. Watch the Asians. Some of the Indians you will see. I've just trained a bunch of Indian corporates, and without mentioning <coughs> names here, it's like when I ask them, uh, why are you here and what's the strategic object? Oh, we'll invest in order to acquire. I go, oh my God, this is like uh, years ago in China, which I saw. It's much less, again, uh, this thing. And but watch this by geography. In the US, it has come down from almost a quarter down to 7% 7, 7 only last year. So it's, they're not really acquiring as much as you think when they invest in a startup. I mean, they're buying their own startup. They're still acquiring a lot of other startups, but not the one they have invested. Europe is still relatively high, and uh, 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 I will predict this to come down. They're in the US-Europe jet lag now. And it, it, the data below don't look much at this. The, the, the sample is not large, so it's not actually representative. So I was almost going to skip it and say, these are the mature markets, and on a global scale, this is what it looks like. Last point, performance. I'm always being asked, so the last few years I've really kicked in a lot on performance. And I'm giving you something to think about. I'm showing this to visas, I'm showing this to corporate visas. Um, you take a software company, SaaS, just stand an Apple with Apple comparison startup. And then you look at New Zealand, Taiwan, Singapore, Japan, US, I'll throw in the number for Europe in a minute, which I haven't put on here. And then you look at valuations. What are the valuations? Alone between New Zealand and Taiwan is 155% <coughs> difference. Between Singapore and Japan, it's 154. And then you look at across the entire chain here, and what do you see? The spread of, I mean, my joke is like, invest only in New Zealand. If you are for financial returns in, you get up to 10 times better valuation than if you invest in the same banana startup in, in, in the US or in Silicon Valley. And so it's the valuation arbitrage. And I'm coming now to the point of, you know, if, if you're a VC investor, it's different than you are a corporate investor about the arbitrage animal. But the arbitrage is absolutely significant. And I'll show you a few slides that probably very few in this room have ever seen. Um, I, going back, and I left out all these slides I have historically from 85 to now, uh, looking at the performance of top performers, medium, bottom, quartile performers, US versus Europe. US, Europe just sucked big time. So, and but the one thing is, and all my friends, I'm a Swiss, I'm Europe, and I spend a lot of time in other geographies. They say, we don't even look at Europe anymore for that reason. I go, like, guys, wait a minute. I'm going to wake you up very big time. Look at this. It was true. Europe could not even have profits during the dot-com boom, right? And not even there. So it was bad. But when it happened, what, what you're seeing now, over time now, over time now, and particularly recently, and I give you the rationale behind it, that the, the, the performance of European investments into Startups, and it's not this is not corporate. This is just across all the investments that we have taken, uh, is is significant. 
Meaning, why is Europeans performing so much better? And I'm telling you, when I trained a lot of the Chinese and the Indian corporates recently, very stunning. They're starting to look at Europeans and say, I can get the same deal about two and a half to three times cheaper in Europe at the same stage of development for the same company, which they have only looked, I call it US and Silicon Valley in the past. And so, so what's happening, why has Europe, I think, have they become a lot better or not? No, it's very simple. There is about two and a half to three and a half times less money going in into the same company to reach the same, I call it milestone, more or less, if they're local. On the other hand is, and I've been teaching this for 15 years, no, I, think, I, I was like frustrated. I didn't teach it anymore. I said, you should invest doing and raise these deals. In, if you're after pure financial returns, invest in Europe with very frugal, it's like almost like a, a, a hinterland Indian frugal startup, and you exit it to the US corporates. <coughs> the arbitrage there is amazing. However, people started challenging me. I said, Marty, that's what you told us. I, in reality, as an investor, I figured this out. But no one knows. There's no headline. And so it's, I said, it's very simple. If you invest in the US, 100 million in a startup, and, and uh, <coughs> or a 200 million in a startup, and he exits for five or 600 million, you get a two, three X, and that gets like, oh, that may make it to the front page somewhere of a Wall Street Journal, perhaps, in a new market segment. If you invest, I call it, uh, 50 or 100 million, and you get acquired for four or 500 million in the US, or let me make it even worse than that. Even for 200, 300 million, that will never make any front page. No noise whatsoever anywhere. But from an investor's perspective, the multiple is way higher than what you have in the US. So I looked at what generates, what generates these returns. If it's IPOs, I can tell you, it's a lot better here in the, in the, uh, in, in the US, the multiple you get on exits because of, of the sheer liquidity of the public markets. If it's on acquisition international, that's where Europe gets a much, much higher multiple on their investment because they have started to exit a lot more to the Americans and now watch the Chinese and Indians coming in. Here is a question. Uh, well, I'll, I'll share my personal experience, Great. and perhaps you can comment on that. Yeah. I've raised money in both sides of the Atlantic. Okay. And how long in ago? the US. How long, how long ago? How long? Uh, US was about five years ago. Okay. E Europe was maybe 10 years ago. Okay. The two messages are very different. Yeah. In the US, whatever it takes, get to the top. In Europe, use my money wisely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the two different messages I got from VCs on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, it may change, but I want to no, no, share okay. that for your point. I, I fully agree with you. It's fully agree with you. Europeans' ambitions as well. I mean, I, I don't want to divert too much on this today, but it's correct. The ambition of Europeans, and even the Swiss that I'm also looking at, it's a uh, they're happier, it's, I call it almost like a lifestyle issue. If you go to a certain size, and they're happy with it. While in the US or in China, you know, the bigger the better, and actually even sometimes beyond their capability, right? 10 years ago, it was even a lot worse. That's why I was asking when it was. What's happening today, right now, is that a lot of more US <coughs> guys, and I looked at the, the largest deals, country by country, top 10 in each country in Europe, and whenever it's a large deal of the top 10, six to eight have now a US, have now a US, uh, um, a US investor in with deeper pockets. That's what I'm saying. And uh, Europe doesn't, just doesn't have, I, can, I don't want to go into, I'm, I'm being signaled to, to, to go forward. But the capital, the capital is not there. That's the problem. Okay, so, uh, so three last slides. The last will take two minutes, but it's the key one. I get it to surprise you. But if you look at corporate VCs versus pure VC, it, it's, it's barely seen. The dark one is with a corporate VC. The other one is no corporate VC in. That is the medium later stage round size. So it's very clear that you normally get roughly about two and two and a half times more money into a deal if a corporate is in or not by it until they exit. 
can be, we can have a Q&A or discussion later. The same thing on later stages. I deliberately look, look, compare earlier stages versus later stages. And because of this, is I call this, uh, you know, the extreme ones are now a little bit <coughs> important. Right? But keep that in mind. It is significant when a corporate in is uh, the size of the round. The other one is um, when I look, we looked earlier a little bit how long it takes to exit. And now I make you a comparison if you have a corporate or not a corporate in, how long it takes to exit. Buy an IPO and buy an acquisition, except of the financial crisis here, just forget this for the moment, it's always the time to exit to an IPO when a corporate in takes just so much longer. And you look at the M and A's, and it's consistent over there for years and years and years and years. They don't have the pressure that starts answering well enough the questions of conflict, right? And I'm telling you, if I have a startup that I invest in, and I only have one corporate or two corporates coming in, I'm telling you there are a number of reasons I'll bring in an independent VC for a lot of reasons. Corporates may fall in love with just the technology and they don't have a pressure to exit. That's one. Valuations may be another pressure. An independent VC will drive it up, uh, for sure. So you have those two. So check and balance is that. I always advise my entrepreneurs taking an independent VC who may be a bit more of a shark in some sense, <laughs> but it, it's better be uh, uh, in a pool with a uh, shark in than having no fish at all. Uh, so, so it does take significantly longer, as you can see. And now, another one. When you look at, and this is good news or bad news, I'm warning you sometimes my entrepreneur and I tease my corporate VCs uh, at the same time. Look at the multiple, the exit multiple, capital in inequity versus capital, you know, the, 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 when you exit. And green is here, no corporate VC. Blue is, is a corporate VC. It's like, wow. If you have corporate, what value do you provide? You must have provided an amazing <coughs> value for some reason. If I were an entrepreneur to take in, that's a little bit my thesis. Really. There's a lot of reasons I take corporate. And it's the same is true, not as extreme, when it comes to M&As. So uh, again, it takes longer. The multiple is worse. And I had some entrepreneurs saying, why should I take a corporate on? I said, well, you have a B2B model, and you will die if you, know, if you don't look for a corporate, whether it's an investor or not. Now, I think this is my last slide. Yeah. So this, uh, I think it's the second or third time I'm showing this. I uh, want to bring you uh, some to some exciting uh, interest. We just talked about multiples on exits. So IPOs. Nine percent of all IPOs exit occur outside the headquarter country of the startup. That's just information for now. Let's watch this. Foreign IPOs, and I have a whole data set on this. I'm only writing down the highlights. Foreign IPOs do better than local exits, except China. And the difference multiple of going to a foreign exchange and staying domestic is 10x versus 41x. So we should all go to China. No, what I'm saying is if you have a Chinese startup, Unless there are some interesting exotic other elements, there's no need to bring them to the US and exit in US. That's what I'm trying to say, or foreign. Because the multiples you get in China for that type of company are amazingly high. Uh, then, another one, local IPOs, and this is from 2010 to 2017. China's multiple, outper look at this, 41x outperforms the US, which had 4x by a factor of 10. <coughs> I'm stunned people are not aware of this. I mean, I did this the first time. Local IPOs in China, so this is another time frame. This is a 2010 to 2017, 2015, so I deliberately looked more recent. What has shifted? It has come down in China, but it's still 24, the US came down, so it's still six times more in China. So my story to this is on IPOs, Unless you're a Chinese, and I was stunned. I'm not sure I have the number. No, I didn't put the US up separately when they exit. Even the ones, surprisingly, a few of them that exit the overseas, in compared to the median, still did better than the median in the US. I go, well, but anyway, any day, compared to 9% IPOs of startups in a foreign country, 24, it's almost a quarter of all the startups get acquired outside their home country. 
it's a little bit different. Foreign multiple, we're almost close to 5x vis-a-vis -vis 4x, except the US. The US, when they were uh, foreign, had a 4x and domestically 4.4x. It's almost within 10% of range. So it's all, in other words, what does that mean from a strategy point of view? I'm saying if you are a US startup, it's almost, almost equal. You can stay in US, you can, that's a median, of course, it always depends on the deals, but just keep that in mind. It, uh, you can stay in the US, um, uh, or you can go international, it's almost equal. So stay in the Euro K. Okay. And however, um, if you are not a US startup, you're doing a significantly better outside your own country being acquired. And again, remember what I said uh, in terms of multiples. Uh, <coughs> Anyway, so. One question. Yeah. Excuse me. This comment about. Uh, turn on the mic. Turn on the mic. Turn it on. Okay. Engineer. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Yeah, yeah. is it working? Yeah. Okay, sorry. So, this 41X yeah. versus much less than that. Yeah. China, not China. Can you comment on whether that's the Alibaba penalty you have to pay because you can't get your money out? Okay, so, <laughs> so one of the effects I did with and without Alibaba, okay? That's always important, but you have to do the same thing in US. Do I take out the Facebook or not? So, so uh, no, the, the, uh, one of the answers I have is the Chinese stock markets are not working in the free market economy way they do in the Western world. However, as a foreigner, as a foreigner, I think it might be pretty hard for you to really understand the details of the Chinese stock markets in order to play properly well. But the reality is, if you look at it from a, a in, an investor's perspective, now you may have invested in Chinese funds, you hear me what I'm saying, in, 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 in Chinese funds which invest in startups and which focus on a lot of domestic exits, that's actually good news. So you can, you're not deprived from not participating. Uh, uh, I'm not sure, does that answer your question or, or, or not? That's okay. okay. <laughs> Come and see me after it's over the drink. <laughs> so, Speaking of the drink. Yes, we are basically done. So I'm saying, all I'm saying is, if it's an IPO, you do likely better overseas or somewhere else. That you can stay in the US, you're still a kind of okay. But you can't beat the Chinese in that sense. If it's an M and A, you're typically better off, except if you're a, you, you, uh, you're uh, so that is the same thing. The dinosaurs here. The, uh, the, the, the returns are and remain the same as in venture capital. It's true for corporate venture capital. Business, takeaways, corporate VC activities have reached peak, even against, uh, remember, the market, the, 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 the public markets, when corporate VC started kicking in. Um, in India and China, it's still a foreign versus domestic play, which is still happening. And most importantly, it's a mo lot more strategic investments that I see vis-a-vis -vis the dot-com bubble. Um, and one last thing, I think this is a key message. I didn't have time, I was gonna spend half an hour on this alone, which was, if you wanna bring a startup international to Silicon Valley, you wanna get the free piece of advice. I did the massive research on this. If you, if, you, if this startup gets right into the market and proves the concept in the market, you look at, you have a choice to go then or you to go much later with a lot more money. All I'm telling you is the success rate of going right after you hit the market, you're right, you adjust your business model for here, maybe and bring your, don't bring your sales guys over here and all these kinds of things. It's a much higher, the earlier you go, as soon as you prove domestic, adjust a little bit to the US, either the strategy for entry, market entry, and or maybe adjust a bit your solution. And to me, that's a key point, because people are debating, do I bring it late or do I bring it early? And um, I mentioned this already. If you have a corporate ECN, 
in your startup uh, or have options to bring corporate visas in, bring an independent visa. That's it. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.